take it away with your street science tonight. Alrighty, so thanks again, Gay. Um, let's just uh, get right into it here. Okay, there's there's a picture of Sekuliak, just to get that out of the way. Um, this, this talk here is really gonna be split into two halves. The first half of it is going to be uh, a description of our high frequency radar or HFR as I'll refer to it at times, uh, installations in the Bering Strait region. So this is a land-based mapping of the surface currents on the ocean. And I'll tell you about how we uh, managed to do that. And then the second half of the talk, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, heat in the ocean and sea ice and heat fluxes between the, the ocean and the atmosphere. And it, it's a bit of a, um, uh, a recap of a study that we published uh, last year. So um, uh, I'd like to start out by thanking our funders for this high frequency radar work. The Integrated Ocean Observing System is a uh, a nationwide consortium that's really our, um, our instrumented eyes on the ocean from, from coast to coast in the country. And there are a number of uh, regional associations and the regional association for Alaska is, is AUS, the Alaska Ocean Observing System. So our funding for this project uh, uh, gets allocated by Congress and sent uh, to IUS, which is a, a branch within NOAA, um, to AUS, our, our local regional association, and they're supporting the ongoing uh, work that we're carrying out here at UAF. Um, but I'd also like to acknowledge that we've had uh, significant past support from the Bureau of Ocean Energy Management, BOEM, and uh, a number of other entities that are listed at the bottom of the, the page here. Um, uh, continuing our, our acknowledgements here, we'd also uh, like to thank um, very deeply our uh, partners in the Bering Strait region, uh, most particularly the landowners for uh, providing the place for us to put our instrumentation on the uh, native corporations in Shishmaref and Wales. And then a couple of very special individuals uh, who have been helping us uh, keep these systems uh, operational and running, especially this year when we haven't been able to access our sites in person. Um, now, our, our team, our UF-based team, uh, we have a, a Twitter feed, it's called at UAF Oceans if you want to follow us, and our, our core team that keeps these data uh, streams running and the field operations going uh, includes Rachel Potter, Hank Statswich, and Jordy Mache, and I'd, I'd like to thank them for all their contributions. Really, I'm just a figurehead here, and, and they're doing all of the, the hard work in keeping this going. So, uh, High frequency radars, uh, HFR, it's, it's what we use to map ocean currents uh, from, from land. And the radar is a little bit of a misnomer because what we're really doing is using radio waves. This is about a five megahertz uh, signal that we transmit out over the ocean from a, a land-based station. And it, it because the ocean is conducting with all of its salt water, we can actually uh, measure the, the radio wave as it bounces off of the ocean waves by doing some fancy uh, electronics timing. And we can compute the Doppler shift that's imparted upon that, that radio wave when it comes back to our receive antenna. And by that, uh, extract the, the speed of the ocean flow um, away from the antenna or back towards the antenna. And these antennas are fairly large. There's a picture of Rachel on the right hand side um, standing next to both the, the transmit antenna and the receive antenna. So each system has uh, two of these antennas and you have to have um, at least two systems to make this an operational uh, unit. And so for instance, you'll have uh, uh, HF radar systems distributed along a coast, such as at Barrow and at Wainwright and at Point uh, Lay. And, um, and it's, it's the regions at which your radial signals overlap is where you're able to get a complete data set. 
at each one of these fans of, um, of grid points, you get a measurement of the ocean speed towards or away from your, um, uh, your antenna. And so you can combine these from two different uh, antenna sets to make the full uh, map of speed and direction of, of, uh, of ocean, uh, ocean currents. So we've had a number of deployments in the past and some deployments ongoing. Our first installations in Northern Alaska were at Point Barrow and at Wainwright back in 2009. And those have been operational every year uh, up until this uh, year, including uh, 2020. Uh, site was installed at Cape Simpson in the Western Beaufort Sea in 2013. And that one continues to operate as, as well. Stations that have been uh, decommissioned from past use include uh, the, the little yellow pushpins there at Icy Cape Point Lay and in, in Prudhoe Bay at the past. Um, and then in 2019, uh, we uh, achieved a, uh, an installation in Shishmaref in Wales, something that we had been uh, hoping to do for a long time. And um, then finally the, the funding was available to do this. So as an example of, of what we get from these types of uh, systems, uh, it looks like something like this. It's uh, a map of arrows that show the speed and the direction of the ocean flows. So the, the arrow, uh, shows the direction that the, the waters are flowing, and then the color of the arrow shows how quickly it's flowing. So the, the yellows and the reds are very uh, swift flows, and the blues are, uh, are slow flows. We get measurements made like this on the order of, of every single hour, and then what we'll uh, typically do is we'll update these maps online, aggregate them into one uh, nice picture for the entire day and, and provide that on an ongoing uh, real-time basis. So there's a website at which one can go to um, and, and get a, a picture of a map such as this uh, in, in real time. Um, as you can imagine, there's, there's a number of different things that one might be able to uh, imagine doing with data like this. Uh, we think that the, the most important application really is, is the public safety applications. Uh, the U.S. Coast Guard uh, likes to have this types of data when they undertake uh, search and rescue missions, especially for um, uh, missing boaters and um, other response type of efforts, such as uh, uh, responding to oil spills, um, marine debris tracking, um, uh, pollution responses. These are uh, all efforts at which knowing the speed and the direction of the currents, especially mapped out over time, can, can be a real benefit to the re response teams. Uh, in terms of marine nav navigation, uh, for uh, vessel operators, knowing the, the speed and the direction of, of the currents is actually can be handy. You can, you can save yourself a few dollars in fuel if you know that if you shift your track just to the east or the west by a, a few miles, if you can either uh, catch a, a current going the direction you want to go or avoid a, a, a counter current, that, that can be handy. Um, uh, things like tracking the dispersion of harmful algal blooms and other, other plankton in, in the water. Uh, the National Weather Service uses HF radars for their marine forecasts. In fact, if you were to look at a map of the, the United States, um, you would see that there's nearly complete coverage of uh, high-frequency radar systems up and down the entire east coast of the U.S., the west coast of the U.S., and about a, a quarter or maybe a little bit less than a quarter of the Gulf of Mexico. It's really the, the coastlines of, the, of Alaska, which um, have the, the biggest gaps in our, our national coverage. Um, there, there's good reasons for that. We don't have a, a, a power outlet every 50 miles down the coast, of course. Um, there's a lot of places maybe that, uh, that don't need such uh, type of measurements, but there are a few places where having these types of measurements would be particularly useful. And we think that Bering, the Bering Strait region is one of those. Um, uh, 
getting measurements of these ocean currents allows us to also uh, validate and even improve on the long time scale our uh, sea ice and ocean circulation models. And of course, there are a lot of uh, scientific research applications as well. In the Bering Strait region in particular, we're interested in the heat, the nutrients, and the plankton that are entering the Arctic Ocean from the Bering Sea. So uh, let's, let's uh, focus in now a little bit more on the, uh, the Bering Strait uh, uh, region systems that we've installed. We uh, got these first operational in the fall of uh, 2019 and um, were able to um, uh, continue measurements uh, somewhat continuously through that fall. You, you wind up um, losing the signal when you don't have waves offshore. So these systems don't operate when your ocean is ice covered. Um, and then last year, as, as you all know, uh, during the the normal summer field season, all uh, COVID, uh, all, all travel for research um, and, and all other activities was uh, impossible due to, to COVID. Uh, but nonetheless, we think that we got some data um, uh, due to the help of our, our, um, our, our partners in, uh, in Wales and Shishmaref. This is the installation in Shishmaref. You can see the two antennas uh, uh, laid out here, one closer in the foreground, one more in the background. And then we have a little hut uh, that has the instrumentation inside. In this case here, the uh, power is routed over from the, the school system. And um, so that outlet has been uh, fantastic for us to uh, get the power from. In, in Wales, uh, here's a picture of the, the hut with the door open. So you can see the instrumentation uh, a little bit on the inside. And um, here's a, a vantage point where you can just barely see the, the little hut in the distance um, uh, at the base of uh, antenna nearly, and then the other antenna uh, uh, in, the, in the foreground. So this is an, I, a couple of examples of the data maps that we uh, got from when the system was uh, transmitting in, in real time. And you can see that the, the flows uh, going through Bering Strait um, can look extremely different from uh, mm -hmm. one day to the next. In one case, we've got a pretty swift flow uh, mm -hmm. uh, all the way across the strait. And in this, this other, and, and the, the winds, which are indicated by this black uh, arrow from, from the Wales airport, um, we're blowing, um, uh, uh, 34 and a half miles an hour to the north. So that, that was a, a nice stiff wind, uh, practically a gale, um, uh, forcing those, helping force those currents northward. Whereas in this other image on September 30th, just two days, three days later, the wind was blowing 20 miles out of the northwest and uh, the, the flow uh, was very much more complex going north through the eastern side of the strait and south through the, the western side of the strait. So uh, another really interesting aspect of this is that uh, we've got data clear over to the, the Russian coast. And that's uh, fantastic because when we go out in our ships and we put our moorings out there, we don't have the ability to make measurements on the other side of the convention line. So this is uh, provides us an ability to uh, get some measurements in a place that we normally can't get them to. Um, but it, it's not a 100% rosy story because we're, we're missing, as you can see, there's, there's a lot of uh, area here that we don't have uh, vectors covered, and we think that we can actually improve that situation. So our, the future improvements that we're looking forward to uh, making here is is getting back to where we're doing some uh, the real-time delivery of the data. And that's going to take a couple of things, but one of them is um, uh, getting our technicians back out to the sites in, in person, hopefully later this year. Uh, secondly, we hope to relocate the system that's uh, presently in Wales. Right now, the, the system in Wales is plugged into Village Power and um, uh, and that, that was great as a test and as the, a proof of concept, 
but we were a little bit afraid that the the coverage would be reduced the way it was shown in that that map on the last slide and so our hope is to uh, relocate that system to to fill in that uh, that gap and then um, and that will hopefully expand the coverage on the north side of the strait and then our, our next objective hopefully will be to um, uh, further expand the, the network coverage on the south side of, of Bering Strait. And so this is what I'm uh, talking about when I think we, that we can fill in the, the data gaps. These are our maps showing the, um, the strength of the signal returns from our Shishmaref site. That is just a, a fantastic looking map where we're seeing well over 100 miles offshore and um, and it, it's a very even uh, type of, of dark red pattern that we're seeing from, from uh, nearly all directions. Whereas the site at Wales um, really has a, a big gap with weak returns both to the north and to the south of Wales. So we think that by uh, moving that site um, along the coast, sort of somewhere along the outer edge of Loch Lagoon there somewhere, will give us the opportunity to make uh, a second map of, of radials uh, that looks something like what I've uh, co colored in with the, uh, the blue there. And, and that will give us uh, a much more fuller coverage in the region and be just that much more useful for, for all of the different applications of the data. Um, and so you might be wondering how we would uh, power such a device and, and it's uh, the same way that we power the HF radar up at Point Barrow and at Cape Simpson um, using what we call our remote power module. This is something that we build here at UAF. Uh, we call them the RPMs and, and they're uh, these, these um, disassemblable, quasi-portable uh, shelters and platforms upon which we mount four small wind turbines and a bank of solar panels and uh, an instrument hut. And there's a, there's a, a satellite uh, data uh, feed for the, the data returns and, and real-time data communications back to our lab in Fairbanks. Um, and, and we've had a site, uh, uh, a system just like this operating up at uh, Point Barrow, I think since uh, 2010 and a site out at Cape Simpson operating since 2013. These things are uh, fantastic workhorses. They were originally designed with um, biodiesel generators at, as backup. And then we realized that the, um, the, the power density of the renewable energy sources along Alaska's coasts are so great that we, uh, the backup generators just never were coming on. And we were able to power the HF radar systems through the entire open water season, uh, completely on the, the solar and the, the wind power. There's a big battery bank in, inside here, which uh, helps uh, power the systems during the days. We can make it four or five days between a, a big wind event or in, in cloud cover. Uh, to keep those systems going. So we have one of these systems, these RPMs uh, built and waiting here at, our, at, at the campus on, at UAF. And uh, the hope is that we can find a time uh, to get out and uh, you know, get our, our technicians out on the ground so that they can uh, verify a, a good site for this system to go um, and then do the, the land permitting and find a, a, a uh, you know, get, get the whale system relocated so that we um, get that north side of Bering Strait uh, pretty much wrapped up and, and into full operational mode. Um, we do have a web page that you can visit at any time. This is uh, www.straitcurrents.com and you can find a, a bit more information about the, the systems there, uh, some other plots of data, um, and, and that really brings me to the first half of this talk. I think I'll, I'm just gonna continue on, um, but uh, if you've got some questions about this, I'll, I'll leave time at the end of the talk here. I, I'm not gonna go too much longer and I'll be happy to answer any questions uh, once I get through the last few slides here. Great, thanks Seth. We'll just hold off until the end then. Sounds Our, good. Okay. Okay. Um, 
All right, so uh, here, here's the second part of this talk. And, and uh, this is really gonna now talk about some data from, from the ocean itself. This is work that was done under the umbrella of the North Pacific Research Board's Arctic Integrated Ecosystem Research Program. Uh, you'll remember that I came uh, through the Bering Strait region a couple times on uh, research vessels to Kuliak in 2017 and, and 2018. Some of this is, is some of the results from those, those cruises. Um, uh, I, I don't have to remind this group that in recent winters we've had extremely uh, low extent of, of sea ice. Uh, here's a plot that shows uh, typical sea ice extents in uh, the, the blue line, which is the average of all those little uh, gray lines over the course of the, the satellite uh, measurement period. Uh, the 2018, this is the 20th of each month from uh, the first four months of the year 2018 is shown in red. And um, in the Northern Bering Sea, you can see that the, the ice edge was um, typically uh, a few hundred kilometers north of where it it, it normally was at that time. Um, so that those those ice extent anomalies um, were often uh, associated with uh, features like this um, indentation of low sea ice through Anadir Strait here that you see in the left hand panel, where uh, this is from a couple of, of days ago. Um, this, this uh, real indentation of, of low ice concentration between St. Lawrence Island and the Chukotkin coast. Um, uh, from today, here's the satellite, passive satellite uh, image on the right hand side. And even though that ice through Anadir Strait has filled in, the pretty much the Gulf of Anadir itself is, is ice free, whereas the, the normal uh, extent for this time, the climatological mean is shown in the in the orange line. Uh, that that's where we would have expected the ice to be in past years. So there, there's there's really two reasons why this indentation through the uh, the Gulf of Anadir happens. One is that the prevailing currents uh, just flow in that direction, and and so uh, they'll uh, they'll want to. Uh, blow the ice northward if there's ice free waters to the south. Um, but also th that that water flowing northward can carry heat and that heat can melt out ice that happens to be there. And it's the constriction of the strait is a um, uh, uh, it generates a whole lot of turbulence in the in the flowing waters. So there there may be heat uh, subsurface that's very uh, effectively brought up to the surface where it can then do the work of, of melting sea ice as it comes through Anadir Strait into Chirikov Basin. So uh, I, I was interested to see how, um, how our measurements in, in recent years compared to measurements of, of years past. And for an example, here's the annual cycle of temperature from two different moorings, one in Bering Strait, a mooring A2 deployed in uh, the mid 1990s, and uh, then one uh, down between Nunavak and St. Matthew Island deployed in 2008 and 2009. And, and this is sort of what I would expect to see of the normal years of, of what we, we thought the system was like in, in the past, where uh, the, the water, and these are, these are near bottom measurements of temperature in each, each case, about 10 meters off the, off the seafloor. Um, so the, the, the temperature of the water gets down to close to the freezing point, about minus 1.7, minus 1.8 degrees in uh, mid-December in the case of Bering Strait and mid-January over the, the central, uh, over the central shelf. And then it, it pretty much the temperature stays right down at the freezing point there for four or five months on end before it starts to warm up again. Well, as comparison, we had a mooring there in Onondaga Strait in 2017 and 2018. And here's what we're seeing now. And I think that this is actually fairly typical of a lot of these, uh, these recent years. Um, in this case here, we only got down to the freezing point 
for a couple of weeks during the 2017-2018 winter in, in March. We never hit freezing in all of December, January, February, or, or April. And that's, to me, this is, um, you know, this is a, a real good indication of the importance of the ocean's role in regulating what that sea ice cover is doing. There's, there's so much heat capacity in the water that um, as it comes through Anadir Strait, it's, uh, it's that, that subsurface heat is easily mixed up to the surface and then it can do the work of, of melting out sea ice that might be around. And uh, if, it's, if it's heat through the whole water column, not just down near the sea floor, um, it explains why no uh, sea ice is forming in the central Gulf of Anadir right now. Um, the water column is just too warm. You won't get sea ice uh, being generated until you get it down to the, to the freezing point. So we did an analysis to look at the change in heat fluxes. So these are, are radiative heat fluxes and, and, um, and turbulent heat fluxes uh, between the uh, ocean and the atmosphere and vice versa. So this in, includes uh, the radiation, long wave radiation in and out of the ocean, downwards from the clouds into the ocean, the short wave radiation from the sun into the ocean, the latent and the sensible heat fluxes between the, the ocean and the atmosphere, and th those can go in either direction. Um, so in these recent years with, uh, with the low sea ice, what we found is that in the springtime with the low sea ice concentration anomalies, the, the ocean albedo is decreased. The ocean is able to absorb a lot more of this incoming solar radiation because the sea ice uh, is either not there or in lower concentrations. That, that kicks off the season early. Additional heat is absorbed through the course of the summer. And then you've got a very warm ocean going into the fall. So in the fall, before you can get back down to uh, making ice again, you've got extra heat that you need to lose from the from the water column to to get back down to the freezing point. And and so what we see is that in the fall, there's a massive uh, additional anomaly of heat loss from the ocean back up into the atmosphere. And that seems to be a pretty consistent signal from from year to year in these uh, these more recent years that, that really are representing a, a brand new thermal regime for the, uh, the Chukchi and the, the Bering Seas. So for my simple brain, just to look at that again, you've got, this is Gabe, you've got what it means with the ice losses, you've got more heat going in because there's no ice. And then you've got more heat that the environment has to work at to Exactly. So, um, you know, any, any heat system can be thought of as a heat engine. And I like to think of it as the heat engine of the, of the Chukchi Sea is accelerated. You're putting more in the spring, you're taking more out in the fall, the, the whole average temperature has been been raised in the meantime. Thanks. Ice has to work harder, I guess. Yeah. Um, and, and there's just not as much of it. And really, I mean, the ice is sort of the consequence of, of these interactions between the ocean and the atmosphere. Um, and yeah, and it, it's playing its own role as well. So, so we have this annual cycle of heat from spring to summer, to fall to winter, where you can pick any time of years, say in, in spring, you have the reduced sea ice volume, extent and concentration. That leads to enhanced absorption of solar radiation by the ocean, which leads to elevated summer and fall ocean temperatures. Uh, the, the summer and fall ocean temperatures we found have increased on average by about 1.4 degrees Celsius um, over the last 100 years. Um, the this te ocean te elevated ocean temperature in the fall uh, leads to an enhanced ocean to atmosphere uh, heat fluxes, which themselves help drive stronger winds from the south to the north, 
which in turn bring warmer airs from the south over the Bering Sea during winter months. And that pushes the sea ice farther north and, and retards the sea ice growth during the winter. So it's sort of a, a positive feedback loop where once you've gotten into a system like this, it's, it's a little bit more uh, difficult to get yourself out of it. Um, and there are many consequences of this altered uh, heat cycle that, uh, that have implications for the timing of the sea ice retreat, um, the timing of the oceanic warming, the amount of heat that the ocean is sending out into the high Arctic basin, the air temperatures in across all of the Arctic, really, um, uh, the heat flux heading northward through Bering Strait uh, from the North Pacific Ocean, and and even the salinity over the, the Bering Sea Shelf. So that's that's a whole lot of talking. Um, I want to leave some time for for questions. So at this point, I think I'll I'll uh, I'll I'll stop here. I'll I'll bring the the slides down, but I, I'm happy to bring them back up at any point if uh, if we need to go back to them for reference and maybe we can get a little discussion going. Well, thank you, Seth. Um, I guess we'll start questions. I know I've got some questions, but I'll throw it open and let other people have a, a crack at it. Thank you. That was very interesting, both of them, and I've got questions for you for, for both. So um, opening it up, does anyone have any questions regarding the high frequency radar setups at Chishmaref and Wales and what they might be capable of? And actually, Kate, if I could jump in, I've yeah, got yeah. one question about the high frequency uh, systems at, at Wales and, and Chishmaref. And, and that question would be, um, you know, from, from the, uh, the Bering Strait point of view, um, uh, do you see this as being a, a useful product and how would you best like to see this delivered? If there are suggestions for um, delivery by website or by social media or, or whatever, um, you know, we have, we, we, we would like to get that input so that we can make it as, as useful as possible. Right. Any, uh, anyone from the Bering Street region want to answer that? I know we've got people here from Nome and around the region. I would say, I would say, I, one to answer your question. I think this is extremely useful, especially when you're talking about things like, um, you know, people have concerns regarding, for the surface currents regarding, uh, what happens if we have an accidental discharge from a large maritime vessel? Will that help the U.S. Coast Guard figure out where that, whatever it may be, soybeans or oil or whatever that falls into the sea, will that help predict where it may go so we can get on top of that or at least get things out of the way if they need to be getting out, getting out of the way or notified. Um, and search and rescue, of course. Um, for me, I, I like the fact that it's transboundary and you're getting information that may be useful also to the other side. And so one of my questions I guess I'm jumping in right now, but one of my questions was the transboundary aspect of this, because I think it has benefit for people on the other side, if they have search and rescue is search and rescue issues. Um, is there any plans to maybe look to Chukotka and going through Chukotkan channels as an Alaskan, because you're at UAF, um, that may be something the region here might be wanting to help you with to bring this across as something that might be shared, shared information, freely shared that has benefit. Yeah, that's a great idea. So, so the data itself is public, um, but, but that doesn't mean that we couldn't necessarily uh, maybe go ahead and make some translated pages um, that would make it uh, maybe even a little bit more useful. Uh, maybe there's some other things that we could do as well. Any other questions for any questions for Seth on this? Rick has, a, Rick has his hand. Oh, Rick, you're so, there's too many people. Yes, go ahead, Rick, please. Um, thanks. Um, boy, that's really informative, Seth. Thank you very much. Um, you mentioned that um, the, the uh, high frequency radar basically doesn't work when there's ice. Um, and so my question would be uh, how sensitive to um, very thin ice or low concentration ice um, is the, is the, the, uh, the high-frequency radar? 
Right. Well, I mentioned that the um, we bounce the radio waves off the ocean waves, and so we need to have ocean waves that are are matched to the radio wave wavelength, which is about I, I can't remember. I think about five meters, and so once once you start getting just a little bit of sea ice, you know, you really damp out the the wave environment, and um, if so if you still have some of those five meter waves, it doesn't take much, you know, a one centimeter, five meter wave will do it, one centimeter tall, um, then you would still get a return, but, uh, but it really does not take too much sea ice to, to damp it down. However, um, if you've got a lot of open water and just sparse ice floating around, you should still be able to get some, some returns. And so certainly if, if all there is is like grease ice, just bobbing up and down in the waves, you couldn't use the, the high frequency radar to detect that. Yeah, it, it would depend on how, how they're affecting that particular wavelength. Um, I, I think that it would go away, it would get damped out pretty quickly. Okay, and then, um, thank you. And then my other question would be data access. Um, from my, so I guess I had two part question. One is the, is, do you have any plans to make the um, digitized data available? Yes, and that gets sent through, I think it's called the Arctic Irma uh, portal, which is available to mm -hmm. uh, all, all the, the federal agencies, certainly for the uh, responses. And I, I think that there are, uh, ways that that other people like you can get to it as well. And, and then um, second question for, oh, and, for your website, um, any possibility of, so right now you aggregate it into daily, any possibility of aggregating the, the mean current into like weekly time scale? Uh, that's a good question. And we, we've done some of that. It's, it's probably not posted. Um, uh, but we can probably find a way of getting some of that to you. We've had graduate students in the past working up that data uh, from the Northeast Chukchi Sea. There's been a lot of analysis done on, on that data and, and we continue to do it. So um, yeah, and in fact, we've, there are some papers I can point you to where um, there are aggregates of the ocean current responses based on the different wind directions and wind strengths. And that's a really useful product because there's a lot of consistency in the ocean wind uh, relationship there. Okay, great. Thank you very much. You bet. And I think, Carol, if you don't, if you had a comment on what Rick was saying, that'd be great. I know that um, Molly and Vince had un, um, videoed themselves, so I think they may have a question too. Yeah, I was just going to say you can access, uh, Rick, you can access those data on the ACE, um, on the ACE data portal. And also through the um, HFR DAC, which is run through uh, CORDC. So I can send you links if you want to download data. Yeah, that'd be great. Thank you very much. I hope that makes sense to you, Rick. <laughs> That's a lot of acronyms. Molly and Vince. Thank you, Gay. Hey, yep. hey, Seth, great presentation. We really enjoyed it. Thank you. Um, something I was wondering about the, um, the, the WAVE project. Um, since the sites to collect the data are in villages, has there been any effort to either train people in the villages to help maintain it and collect the data? And has there been any work, two parts, has there been any work to work with the community to, to share that information with the, the community? Yeah, thank, thanks for that. Um, uh, yeah, so we have been working with um, uh, with Michael Akinga Sr. In, in Wales, and he's been a great help for helping uh, keep these things maintained. Um, like I mentioned, there are some uh, there are some reasons that our our uh, technical team needs to get back to the sites uh, to get them fully operational. But he's been a great help in getting. I don't think we would have gotten any data at all if it wasn't for for him this year. Um, and we would like, we don't have actually right now um, a, a person who's uh, uh, got his interest in getting into the huts and keeping them running in Shishmaref the way we do in, in Wales. Um, 
our, our help at the Shishmaref school system has really been on the power side. But if you have any ideas of, of or know of anybody in Shishmaref that would be willing to lend a hand, we'd, we'd really like to find somebody that, that would have that. Seth, but you're working with the tribes? Yeah, we're, we're, we've been working primarily with um, uh, the, the corporations because they're the landowners, right? And has there been any work to, to share that, this information with the, the local schools and the students? Um, no, but that's, that's another, um, you know, I, I guess I would say that uh, that's something that we want to do. It's been tough with COVID. Um, you know, we've been really, uh, you know, uh, we haven't been able to get out there the way we want to. When we have projects like this in, um, uh, uh, in, in other villages, in, in uh, Ukiavik and in, in, in Wainwright, we do make uh, school visits when we do come by and we enjoy doing that, yes. Also, thank there you. was a, oh, I'm sorry. I was just saying, thank you. Thank you for your question and time. Um, and Seth, I got a direct message here that's not in the chat, um, that it says that they would suggest using Facebook um, because people here are watching Rick Toman all the time. And so that works. And so Facebook may be a way, I, I myself would recommend a, a website as well as, as putting out um, um, a, a website and a Facebook and, you know. So thank you for the comments on that, that were sent. Appreciate that. Um, others with, I guess we've been talking about the high frequency radar, but we also have been talking about the temperatures too. Any questions on that? It's a great opportunity to hear uh, a physical oceanographer who actually knows the Bering Strait region um, very well. So ask away. If not, I have another, I got lots of questions. Fire away. Okay. So one of, I guess it's not a question, it's a comment. One of the things that you'll probably and you would probably recognize this is the importance of, of traditional knowledge in the region. When I look at your your um, surface currents, where you had the the south winds, no, the where it was really strong one way, and then as soon as you got the the winds out of the other direction, I think out of the uh, north, it started to make like a gyre, mm -hmm. just north of Diamond. So those kind of big oceanographic features are, are something that are, are um, this kind of data confirms all that information. So I don't know how much, when you're in the village, I know you've been hampered with all the COVID precautions and all that, but when you get in there, you may wanna, I think you'll have great interest and I think you'll learn, uh, have a really cool opportunity to learn how this matches up as soon as people are able to see the results of that high frequency radar. Yeah, we, we see it as a, as a really great complement to the, the local knowledge. Um, I, I was uh, really honored to have the opportunity to participate in, in a coeric workshop about six or eight years ago on uh, indigenous currents in the Bering Strait region. And there was a little uh, a publication that, that came out of that and a lot of interviews. And we spent a, a couple days um, uh, at the Queric offices um, discussing uh, the, our, our understanding of, of the currents. Uh, there were two of us Western scientists and there were a lot of boat captains, um, experts in the oceanography from, uh, from the, the local perspective. And it, it was just, it was, uh, you know, you, you can always point back to um, a handful of, of times in your career that uh, things really stand out in your mind. And that particular workshop was one of those where um, I, I felt like we had a, um, uh, a, a really fantastic uh, set of discussions. And I, I just learned so much from, uh, from those discussions. I, I'd love to have the opportunity to chat with uh, the, the boat operators again in, in any of the villages that we get to. Um, thanks. I've been look. I'm trying to my I'm at maximum capacity here running this uh, Zoom at home, but um, I'm trying to get the. There's a website for Quark that has a list and has that as a PDF that you can download, I believe. And so I'm trying to get that to 
I can get the PDF to pop up, but not the website yet. So um, bear with me, but we'll try to get that in. Um, I see one, one question. Um, how do you transport the RPM units from Fairbanks to the field? Um, and, and this depends on the site that it's actually going to. Um, the uh, one way to do this is to put it onto a, a landing craft barge and actually have this landing craft drive up onto the beach. The, the RPM units are completely disassemblable and um, no one unit weighs more than a hundred pounds. So they're made to be um, like a sort of a rector set that we can take apart and put the parts into, um, into small planes, onto loads that are towed behind four wheelers or snow machines. Um, so we, we envision them as being fairly um, flexible in their deployment. And so when we, when we finally settle on a particular site, then we start looking at what's going to be the most um, uh, the, the most cost effective and labor effective way of, of getting the RPM uh, deployed in the field. And um, if, and if there's uh, local help that is interested in helping us put these things together, um, we try to uh, hire local help and, and, and train uh, people as well. All right, thanks. Thank you on that. And I'm just putting in there the name of the Bering Street Currents book and the Coeric website where you can find that and download that. So. All right, no one had questions about the oceanography in the Bering Strait and that great graph of the, or great example of the temperature difference over time. Hey, Lyle has a hand up. Oh, Lyle, well done. Sorry, not used to seeing such proper use of Zoom. It's good. <laughs> Hi, uh, Seth, and thanks for this talk. It's very appreciated. Um, since it doesn't sound like you have other questions, I have one that's not 100% related to your talk, but it's something that I, I becoming very curious about and you're a great resource to try to help with this. So under the ice um, near bottom bottom temperatures in the winter, you know, it's usually around negative 1.7. We see that from the moorings, you know, all throughout the Bering Sea and the Northern Bering Sea, that kind of basin water. But do you have a feel for what the near bottom water temperatures under the ice are closer to shore? Um, I'm asking this because you know, I'm sure you're aware of all the stuff that's happening with, say, Pollock and um, Pacific Cod moving into the northern Bering Sea. There was a lot of theories that these fish are moving out as the ice descends in the winter. Um, but oddly enough, because of all the um, gold dredging that happens around Nome in the winter under the ice, we've received a whole bunch of videos now showing fish fairly near shore that are under the ice. And we're starting to wonder if some of this population is actually moving into shallower water in the winter, or maybe they got trapped there. These and are Pacific so anyway. cod, well, the fish that they're and near. Pollock, Pollock. And Pollock. Yes. My goodness, okay, thanks. So trying to figure out this kind of just this idea, are they trapped there or are they moving towards a better thermal refuge? I.e., is, is there a chance that the water closer to shore is actually staying warmer? Boy, unless you're getting like some active runoff of rivers that's that has above, you know, the river water would be coming in at zero. So that's above the freezing point of the ocean water, which is at minus 1.7. That could be, a, that could feel a little bit warm, I suppose, to a fish. But in general, I, I, I typically think of under ice ocean water, if it's, if it's under the ice, it pretty much wants to be at the freezing point because if there's heat, that that heat will do its work and and start melting the ice and it, it sort of quickly comes into an equilibrium. Um, so there would have to be some sort of stratification to be able to keep the near bottom water really above um, a, a, above the freezing point. And so you, I guess, you'd have to have what would it be, a, uh, a real uh, fresh lens? 
up higher. In the near shore, let's, let's look, think about it this way. In the near shore, the, the water depths are not that great. And they cool off to the freezing point pretty quickly in the fall. So, and that's why we wind up developing ice near shore a lot sooner than farther offshore because you have less of a water column to lose heat from. And if everything else being equal, you're, you're losing heat sort of at about the same rate. So in, in general, I would think that the, um, that, that water would wanna be near the freezing point, but Gay raised her hand and she'll, she'll probably have some way to prove me wrong here. No, not to prove you wrong at all. I just wanna add, and, and any of the nomites here, feel free to chip in. Um, you know, we just did the Christmas bird count and, or, or if you go down to the Nome River uh, mouth here in right in front of town to um, fire off your fireworks or whatever, we've had open water where that river, even in when it was minus, Jim, what was it? Minus 15 or 20 that day. And we had, um, you know, we had birds in open water as from that runoff, uh, we had, a, I don't know, 300, 100 yards of open water. And that, that bird, we had a common merganser of all things in there feeding on something. So there were, we figured small fish and that that warm river water and it was act, you know, it's flushing out, so it's it's turning it around. But I never thought of that as maybe a fish refuge for ocean fish, but that's pretty interesting. But we do have several rivers. So if those, I don't know the locations of, of where Lyle's getting the videos from, and it looks like he may have dropped, I don't know. On this no, thing. I didn't drop. I, I just want to make sure I wasn't giving you a background noise. Um, no, I mean, what Seth described is what I thought, you know, from my limited oceanography background, but I just wanted to make sure there wasn't something big I was missing. Right. Because I would have figured those areas would cool off quicker. And this behavior where we're seeing, you know, say in the summer, we don't really see in our survey the Pollock near shore, but you know, the, these videos that we're getting and uh, um, we're trying to get location information. Uh, Discovery Channel, after this came up, is now trying to cobble together pieces of video for us um, to, to try to document this. It's very interesting. And those waters I would have thought would be just as cold, if not colder, or they would become, if they were a little warmer, it would because of freshwater one off and then something like a pollock would have an issue with the fresher water and lensing. So I still don't know if I understand why they're doing this behavior, but it's interesting. Yeah, there's, there's been times I've been surprised where, uh, and typically this, is, I, I can think of a couple times where I might have 60 meters of water and I would have thought on an Arctic shelf, 60 meters of water would be just right at the uh, freezing point from top to bottom through the whole winter. And sure enough, there was some subsurface heat sitting down there. Um, but gosh, when you're talking about 20 meters and less, it's hard to think of um, a lot of processes that would keep heat around. Ice keels are so efficient at mixing the water as it flows by, you know, do the tides or anything else. Um, it, it's tough to maintain stratification unless you got a huge river there. Well, I think anybody in Nome would know where the Discovery Channel was getting their footage from. Does anybody have any ideas on why we might have warmer water or why we'd see Pollock or Pacific Cod in the winter under the ice? Speak up now. I have, I don't hear anything. So I've got one last question for me. I don't want to shut it down, but um, the, for, for safety reasons, if we're traveling, if people are traveling in the Bering Strait region and they come upon one of your remote huts and it has uh, power and it has a satellite dish, is there access to the internet? So if you're traveling and you want to get out a message or for whatever reason, is there a way to plumb into that system? Uh, yes. So the, the systems that we have that have their own internet um, has a Wi-Fi and we leave that open for anybody to use that's coming by. Um, in fact, uh, for those RPMs up on the, the North Slope, we leave them unlocked as well. And we've heard stories of people actually taking shelter for a night inside the huts. Um, never had any damage. It's been fantastic. Do, do you 
have any kind of instruction on the side of the house there or those little huts that says here's where you if you're in a if you need to make a call or you need to send a text a good bad or ugly i made it to here or we need help or i'm climbing in your i'm climbing in your box for the night um is are there any kind of instructions for somebody passing you know i don't i don't think there are but that's not a bad idea to have a couple additional words yeah, because you, you have one looks like pretty remote there or some of your other ones. And it would just be a shame if somebody like myself who would be like, well, I don't know, maybe not touch, but it might be something that might really be a lifesaver. Right. Yeah. And 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 maybe just to get back to the question about um, uh, local help for maintaining these things, uh, we've been doing this, you know, up in uh, along the North Slope for a bit longer. And um, th those systems ran really well this year. Uh, in fact, and just today and yesterday, um, our partners at UIC went out and uh, assessed the system for us, uh, pulled out the hard drives, uh, both from the site at Point Barrow and today was at, at Cape Simpson. And those hard drives will be back in the mail to us um, uh, for us to look at the full data set, you know, in person uh, just in a week or so. So. Um, yeah, we, we do have manuals and we do have sort of a, a training system where we, we, we do really like enjoy get, uh, getting people deeply entrained in, in running these things. It's, I mean, there's just so many reasons to do this. Number one, it's, it's, um, it's also cost effective. It saves us a trip to uh, fly to the North Slope. Works well for everybody. Yeah. With that, any other questions? Mr. Mason, you have anything? Or Kathy, Kathy R. All right. With that, if there's no other questions, you might want to show our speaker a little love in the chat box. If you go down to the bottom of your screen, there's a little bubble that looks like someone's talking, like a cartoon. Oh, you already got applause. And it's, um, well done. Thank you, Molly and Vince. Everyone start really knows their Zoom, except for me. And then if you hit the chat button, you can actually um, type in like a text. And that's that's always really nice for our speakers because it's it's not always a, a, it's kind of, you know, I'm not a, I don't relish public speaking, but here is Seth on a Thursday night. And thank you to all of you who've uh, attended, especially those of you who are in a different time zone. Holy cow. Thank you so much. You got a thumbs up from Rick. Oh, it's all good. So thank you all. And I'll give a shameless plug. In one week, we've got Stephanie O'Daly. She's also with UAF, College of Fisheries and Ocean Sciences. She'll be doing the straight science on the 14th at 630. And she's going to talk about ocean warming, algae uh, gr growth, and maybe um, redistribution, but distribution, algae distribution, and then CO carbon dioxide uh, removal. And what does the warming ocean mean regarding carbon dioxide removal? Is it going to be more or less? And, and what are the plans for uh, algae redistribution, given the, the uh, changes that we're experiencing? So that's what is up on deck for a week from tonight. So we hope to see you there as well. Seth, dreamy as always. Thanks a lot, Gay. Thanks, we'll see you soon. You bet. Hey, Seth, can you hang on a second? Absolutely. Hey, I got a I got a hypothesis on the the fish under the ice this year. Oh, okay. Let's hear it. So, um, so up up till now for for the Bering Strait Northern Sewer Peninsula area, um, the the weather has been quite variable. So there's there's been these intermittent periods when it's been cold and the ice has formed, and then it switches around. And so I'm wondering if it's possible that that given the very low ice concentrations and ice extent up till now, that when the when these times when the winds shift around to some version of south, if we're getting transport of warmer water underneath the ice surface, so that that keep that's keeping the water a little bit warmer than if the ice had been in place for months, kind of thing. Right. So get so like a, a bolus of of heat. Uh, advected under under an ice pack and then maybe that that heat actually melts the bottom of the ice a little bit and makes a stratified layer where it's really fresh at the surface and 
that then sort of if it's if it's not flowing strongly, then you could actually keep that heat away from the ice from doing its job of mixing. Um, you, you might be onto something there, Rick. You know, because because Nome didn't have any ice until almost the middle of December, mm -hmm. Around the and we've had these repeated, not big but pushes of warmer air working on the very thin, very um, broken um, ice cover um, offshore. Yeah, just a just an idea. Yeah, well, and it, so and this is the type of thing where um, you know Rebecca's moorings across Bering Strait might be super valuable in piecing out how much heat is still going north, even once you have some sort of ice cover out there. Cool. That's cool. So it actually might be that it's insulating itself from the ice, the water then. Yeah, there, there's that possibility. You know, it's this delicate balance of stratification and mixing energy. Um, that's pretty cool. That's the first time that was neat. I don't think um, uh, Lyle's on here right now, but that was pretty amazing to hear that, that they were picking that up and under the ice, Pollock. Yeah, yeah. And Cod, right here, wintertime. Kind of amazing, um, at least for my brain. So, so thank you all, unless anyone.